So it is my great privilege today to receive for the third or fourth Alpha seminar of this year someone that is well known in the house, Bert Loriden, for our colleagues from the University of Antwerp. Many of you know how he wrote extensively on mechanism, but now he's moving to a, to a new and intriguing ground. So after a one hour talk of Bert, we will have a comment by Pierre André. I did it work. Okay. Come on by Pierre André, and after that, a general discussion. So, you have the floor, Bert. Um, well, thank you very much. Um, it's an honor to, to be here. Thank you for the invitation. It's uh, decades since I've been able to talk about my research for a, a live audience, and it's, <laughs> it's, it's nice to be able to do that again. Um, I must say that I had expected uh, some uh, master students in this room. So the, the first slide, we invited them. But <laughs> I, I'll, I'll present it anyway, but um, we should not make it a very long and a deeply philosophical discussion. It's, it's just to, to, to point to some of the key issues I'm, that I'm trying to address. So suppose you have an urn, and you know that it has uh, only black and white balls, but there are plenty of them. And you want to know uh, how many black, how many uh, white. Uh, to make it a bit more concrete, let's test the hypothesis that 80% uh, of them are black. Uh, so you need observations, of course, to, to, to test this hypothesis. And let's say that the observation consists of a report on the color of 20 of the balls that have been taken from this urn. 17 of those 20 are black, the rest is white. Then the question is whether this observation confirms this hypothesis, or doesn't it? So, well, yeah, let's pretend you're master students. What's your, your <laughs> first uh, reaction? And we will not take, uh, use uh, uh, much time. But what's your first reaction? Yes. Yes? No? Why no? Uh, no, I say yes. Ah, okay. <laughs> That's nice. Thank you for saying yes. <laughs> so, I will not talk, well, I, I will talk about black and white balls, but not for uh, very long. Um, I will talk about the concept of evidence in uh, the, the, the research, research program uh, uh, called Evidence Based Management. I'm a philosopher of science. Um, and only a philosopher of science, so I, I'm, not in, uh, well, I'm not an economist, I'm not in management studies, I'm not a manager, whatever. Um, I'm only a philosopher of science. So is uh, Eric Weber, he, he used to be my uh, supervisor uh, back at the time at, at Ghent University. And together we are uh, teaching a course in the research master, we have a joint research master program with the universities of um, Ghent, Antwerp and the, the Vrije Universiteit Brussel. And uh, the, the course we are teaching together is uh, called Philosophy of Biomedical and Social Sciences. And one of the topics we have been discussing for the past uh, years is evidence-based medicine, evidence-based policy. And one of our students in, uh, in the last year and two years ago was Anne Weiverkens. She's a, a philosophy student, but she has, uh, before she, she's an older student, before she started studying uh, philosophy, she uh, has had a, a long career in um, management uh, functions in HR departments and so on. And so we asked the students to, to write a paper on, for instance, evidence-based policy, and she stumbled upon this uh, evidence-based uh, management project. And, and now together we're uh, co-authoring a paper on the concept of evidence, -based, uh, evidence in evidence-based management, uh, starting from discussions uh, uh, last year. Evidence-based management is a research program initiated mostly by uh, Denise Rousseau. She's in uh, Carnegie Mellon. Um, and together with Eric Barnes, I will say a little bit more about these two people, but not very much about the people themselves. They um, uh, promote evidence-based management as a way to use evidence to make better uh, organizational decisions. And um, uh, Eric, uh, Anne and I were very sympathetic towards that, that project, so, so we really like it. 
except for the fact that uh, when you look at the details of how they talk about evidence, that's somehow misleading, uh, some, in some sense uh, too liberal, in a way that undermines um, their own aspirations. So what we uh, want to do is um, using insights that are not very uh, new or innovative from uh, the methodology of the social sciences and from uh, philosophy of science to advocate a, a more um, um, strict definition of evidence which uh, can be applied to evidence-based management and therefore, or, or in that sense, uh, help to improve or, or to, to, to boost the program. I apologize for the, the... Can you read it at the back? Okay. Uh, so I will start by briefly uh, characterizing the uh, research project itself. <coughs> say a little bit uh, more about why they have initiated it. And then I will say um, a bit more about how they define evidence as opposed to information and as opposed to data. Um, and then I will show that the way they talk about evidence is in a, in a, as a two-place relation, whereas we advocate a three-place account of information, uh, sorry, of evidence, uh, using, start, well, I will start with a, a very simple toy example, then I will move to, to some um, more um, uh, genuine, uh, methodology of the social sciences, but all very basic, uh, all the, 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 the added complexity that you could wish from, um, well, from uh, social sciences or from environmental sciences, whatever, will only um, strengthen our point, namely that evidence uh, should be treated as a three-place uh, relation. Then we will um, present this, this logical procedural approach to, to uh, give a, a more strict definition of what we mean. And then I will turn to the book. Uh, they talk about using evidence from practitioners. They talk about evidence uh, from the organization that you're running as a manager. Uh, about evidence from stakeholders. And time and again, I will show that um, um, they give really valuable advice valuable for companies, for uh, managers. But sometimes what I say is misleading and, and that can be remedied by our uh, free place account. And at the end, I may zoom out and, and um, uh, touch the, the question, um, what our role as, well, for, uh, I'm now mostly talking about myself and, and people like me, philosophers of science who are not in, in management studies and so on, how should we relate to uh, the field of um, um, uh, managers, um, given that we are um, not part of that field? Anyway. Um, so this is Denise Rousseau from Carnegie <coughs> Um and she's in uh, organizational behavior and public policy. So she's not a philosopher. Uh, Erik Barnes is the managing director of a center they have created. It's based in, in Leiden, in the, in the Netherlands, the Center for Evidence-Based Management. So they're not just trying to, to, uh, uh, to, to uh, reflect intellectually, academically, uh, uh, on, on uh, the notion of evidence-based management. They're really trying to promote it uh, to people in the field. And one of the initial observations uh, that, that drives uh, their program is the fact that uh, management research has shown that uh, very often uh, decisions taken by managers, taken by organizations, fail. So they, they talk about roughly half of the decisions do not um, uh, give rise to the intended uh, result. One of the reasons being that um, such decisions are very often uh, driven by the opinion of the highest paid person in the organization. So the hippo is the highest paid person's uh, opinion, and whatever he or she thinks 
has a very strong influence on, on um, uh, decisions being made. And Eric Barnes and Denise Rousseau uh, say, well, if we change the way um, management is uh, done in practice, and if we um, um, stimulate managers to use more evidence, that will help to improve uh, managerial decisions. So this is how they, they um, define the research project. Evidence-based management, they write, is about making decisions through the conscientious, explicit and judicious use of the best available evidence from multiple sources. And what you need to do is, if you have a practical issue or a problem you try to solve, you have to turn it into something that you can, uh, into a question that you can try to answer using evidence. Then you go searching for the evidence. Once you have it, you have to assess whether it's uh, reliable enough, whether it's uh, relevant enough. Then you, you put it all together and um, you incorporate it into the uh, decision-making process. At the end, you can check whether you did fine. Um, and uh, by doing so, uh, you hope to increase the likelihood of a favorable outcome. Instead of just uh, following the hippo. Um, in the coffee room, uh, Alexander asks, well, is this similar to, or is this inspired by evidence-based medicine? I presume you all have heard about evidence-based medicine. Well, if you, you compare this, the, the quote on the previous slide with uh, this, it, it's a quote from Sackett et al., one of the <coughs> founding sources of evidence-based medicine. It's, it's almost uh, an exact so it's very uh, strongly inspired by evidence-based <coughs> medicine. But I, I will not talk about EBM uh, today. Okay. So the goal is to use evidence uh, in order to improve organizational decisions. And evidence is not the same as data in their uh, book. And it's not the same as information. Data, it's a bit fishy how in some sense, you could uh, think about it in terms of just uh, ones and zeros. But also, uh, text can be data, words can be data, images can be data. Um, the point of data is that by itself, it's completely meaningless. It's just words, just uh, strings of numbers, just uh, pictures. It's not meaningful because it's, um, it's considered on its own without uh, any context. It only becomes meaningful by putting it in a context, by interpreting it. But then it becomes information. In, by definition, it becomes information. So uh, by organizing the data, structuring it, analyzing it, and interpreting it, the data becomes information. But information, um, is meaningful, but not by definition uh, evidence. It's only evidence um, if it's, uh, if it, if it's um, related to a specific claim or hypothesis or theory that you want to uh, test. So evidence is always evidence for or against a claim hypothesis. Um, so it's information supporting such a claim or contradicting such a claim. So you can have positive evidence, you can have negative evidence. Um, so they, they define uh, information in terms of data and uh, evidence in terms of information. But this definition of evidence is strictly two place, we argue, and we want a, a three place definition instead. Um, it's two place because they just uh, relate the meaningful data, the information, to the hypothesis and nothing else. Whereas we uh, will argue that uh, you need to take into account the method that has been used, the procedure that has been used to obtain the data and hence the information um, as a third co uh, component in the in the equation. And we will start illustrating this idea 
by going back to um, uh, prehistory of um, uh, philosophy of science. So if you look at how Hempel wrote about confirmation, you see that he treated confirmation in a strictly two-place sense, and that made him vulnerable to some, some uh, counter-arguments. Uh, so um, at the time, um, claims like all ravens are black were the typical examples being used to talk about uh, confirmation. How can you confirm the hypothesis, the, the conditional hypothesis that uh, for everything that exists, if it is a raven, then it is black? Well, you, you uh, look at positive instances. So if you have an observation uh, report involving uh, three objects, A, B, and C, and you <coughs> notice that all of them are ravens, and it's also the case that all of them are black, then, um, using uh, Hempel's jargon, from this observation report you can deduce, by, by ordinary classical logic, uh, the development of the hypothesis that for every uh, object, if it is a raven, then it is black. So the, the development is what the hypothesis would say if only the ob objects uh, mentioned in the observation report uh, exist. Uh, so since um, uh, from the hypothesis, well, the uh, hypothesis would come down to this development if only those three objects exist. And since you can derive this from the observation report, the report directly confirms the hypothesis. What is not mentioned at all is, uh, or a question that has not been raised on the previous slide, is how we came uh, to where this observation report uh, came from. So how was this uh, observation report obtained? That's not uh, something that, that, uh, that he paid much attention to. So uh, confirmation is just about the observation report in relation to the hypothesis, purely to place. Now I will uh, present two toy examples and then we will move to, um, to uh, some uh, well, things like parameter estimation in, in uh, scientific practice. But first the toy, toy examples and then an alternative uh, definition of Hempelian confirmation that makes it uh, three place. And, and what we will do here, we will repeat in the coming slides uh, with regards to uh, practically or scientifically more uh, relevant uh, issues. The first uh, toy example comes from uh, Sir uh, Arthur uh, Eddington, the, the one who um, confirmed uh, general relativity during the uh, solar eclipse in, in uh, 1919. He wrote a book about philosophy of the physical sciences and he tells a story about a scientist, an ichthyologist, who wants to investigate um, sea creatures. So he, he wants to uh, observe sea, uh, sea creatures and um, test hypotheses. So what he, he does, he, he takes a fisher's net and um, catches sea creatures. And um, the observation report consists of many sea creatures that all have gills, and that all are relatively large. There are none of these uh, uh, sea creatures in his catch are uh, very small. So um, he, he um, says, well, um, this seems to confirm my hypothesis that uh, all sea creatures uh, have gills, and, and following uh, Hempel, that would be true. It also confirms a hypothesis that no sea creature is uh, less than two inches long. But then, and now I, I quote uh, Eddington, an onlooker may object that the first uh, generalization is wrong. There are plenty of sea creatures under two inches long, this uh, onlooker may say. However, your uh, net is not adapted to catching them because the meshes uh, of your net are, are just too wide. So the fact that uh, all your observations uh, confirm in Hempel's sense your hypothesis does not suffice. 
Another example. Um, suppose that you want to test the hypothesis that all ibises are red. You observe, it, observe 100 ibises and you uh, note that all of them are um, red. According to Hempel, this would mean that you have confirmed the hypothesis. Um, but as soon as you realize that you have observed these 100 ibises in a zoo, and that the management of that zoo ha has a, a, a peculiar a fondness of uh, red ibises, for example, for aesthetic reasons, then um, you realize that this uh, observation report is useless. And as a matter of fact, there exist green uh, ibises, uh, white ones, uh, black ones, and so on. So what we need, if we want to have evidence uh, for or against the conditional hypothesis, we need an observation report um, that entails, in, in uh, Hempel's sense, the development of the hypothesis for the class of objects mentioned in the report. That's just Hempel. But the report itself um, should have been obtained in a way that um, uh, does not system, uh, create systematic bias. And the net was uh, a problematic procedure going to the zoo was a, a problematic uh, procedure, and so on and so forth. So that's, that's um, the basic insight. Which is not only to be, um, to be uh, applied to um, conditional hypotheses, but also, for instance, to parameter estimation as it is practiced in the social sciences. So for example, the uh, 20 balls that I talked about uh, at the beginning, and the fact that 17 of them are black, three of them are white, does this confirm the hypothesis that at least 80% of the uh, uh, er balls in the urn are black? It depends on how they were selected. If I have carefully selected 17 black balls, maybe the only 17 bl black balls among uh, 2 million white ones, then, then you, you, you see that, um, that uh, this observation report does not uh, confirm the hypothesis at all. It would confirm uh, the hypothesis um, if, if the uh, ball, the 20 balls, would have been selected in a random fashion. And, and the same holds for parameter estimation in the social sciences. If you want to know how many Belgians, or what percentage of people in Belgium, are in, in favor of uh, free public transportation. You cannot in, uh, uh, interview all of them, so you need to interview a sample. And then uh, you, will, you can derive a sample statistic, say 45% uh, of the people I have interviewed are in favor. So using inferential statistics, I can uh, say, um, not, not uh, for certain, but, but with uh, uh, high uh, reliability, how many people in the population are in favor of uh, free public transportation, but only if my sample uh, did not create systematic bias. I've taken a train from uh, Ghent to, uh, to here. If I would have interviewed 100 people on those various trains, then maybe uh, I would have encountered many more people in favor of free public transportation than if I would have selected them randomly. So uh, a random sample, or uh, there are alternatives uh, that also um, typically give rise to a representative sample, um, uh, is what you need for parameter estimation. What I uh, would have done on the train is convenient sampling. It's just, just interviewing those people who are uh, easiest to interview. Um, likewise, um, uh, scientific studies should not only be uh, conducted on uh, university students, because these happen to be, um, uh, well, we, we quote one of these uh, social science uh, methodology books saying exactly this. So, uh, the university student is a <coughs> model organism of uh, many social sciences. Um, that's convenience sampling, and you cannot do, you cannot use convenience sampling for parameter estimation. You can use it to um, to create an exploratory uh, sample, 
to do exploratory research, so to, to come up with new hypotheses, new ideas that then have to be tested in, in a proper way. So just like uh, what we did for Hempel, um, um, we can now do for a ground transformation. Uh, when do you have proper evidence for parameter estimation? Well, if you have a sample um, that, uh, from which you can uh, mathematically derive a parameter estimation, and of course you need to use the right statistical tools, and there are many of them, but all of these uh, require that um, your sample itself is not problematic. Uh, so it must be representative. Uh, well, that must be, you need um, that, uh, a sample that has been obtained using a procedure or method that does not create systematic bias and typically guarantees that the sample is, is representative. Even if you uh, take a random sample, you can be unlucky. Um, you can, uh, by accident, uh, uh, <coughs> end up with a sample that is not representative and, and we should not exclude that possibility otherwise we, we would uh, advocate some uh, friction-free epistemology that's not our goal but um, uh, you should use methods that work most of the time so generalizing uh, from the, the, the two proposals um, an adequate um, um, characterization of whatever type of scientific um, uh, evidence should have a logical component. It should say um, using which methods, be it uh, deductive logic in the case of Hempel, or inferential statistics in the case of parameter estimation, and so on and so forth. So logic is, is logic in the broad sense, including mathematics. So you should say how conclusions are derived from uh, observations, but you also need a procedural component saying how the observations themselves um, have been uh, collected. So apart from the information, the meaningful data, and the hypothesis, you also need um, uh, to pay attention to the method uh, that has been used. Now we will turn to uh, the book by uh, Rousseau and Barnes, Barnes and Rousseau. Um, and, and we will show that um, most of the time they, what they write is uh, correct. Sometimes they, they give misleading information which we fear uh, would lead uh, managers to make bad decisions, to, 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 to take shortcuts. Um, to wonder, this is um, uh, philosophers of science uh, um, stressing things that uh, methodologists of, of the social sciences know for, for a very long time. Is this really relevant for people in the field? Well, we uh, think it is. Um, and, and, and to motivate uh, part of the reasons why um, we think it is, uh, let's turn to a quote at the very beginning of their book. Uh, Rousseau and, and Barnes write that uh, evidence-based man management challenges conventional wisdom, authority, and traditions. Think again uh, uh, about these uh, hippos. Uh, regarding the way decisions are made, uh, it raises the uh, seldom discussed issue in contemporary organizations, namely the quality of the evidence that is being used. So quality of evidence is very important. Uh, challenging conventional uh, wisdom is very important. Um, again, they refer to evidence-based medicine, which was the, the first uh, uh, domain in which uh, going evidence-based was uh, uh, publicly uh, advocated. Since uh, some time you have uh, evidence-based policy, and now they, they jumped on that, that train and uh, advocate evidence-based management. Uh, but the critical appraisal of evidence quality is uh, central. And um, we want to uh, add to this uh, um, project, um, and 
adding to this project is one of the advantages of, of this um, paper we claim. Um, it helps to challenge this uh, conventional wisdom. And it does, and, and I, I think this uh, would be um, music to the ears of managers. It, it makes the uh, application of evidence-based management more efficient if you, if you follow uh, our advice. This is a, a schema from uh, their book showing the different types of evidence. So in one of the first quotes I gave, um, they talk about multiple sources of evidence. One of the sources is uh, published scientific literature. As a manager or as uh, a company, um, you can turn to uh, published scientific uh, research findings. We will not say much about that. Uh, the point is that this scientific research is uh, mostly very uh, general. It, it, it covers larger domains, whereas you as, as a company, as an organization, want to use this to, to, to uh, solve specific problems, taking into account uh, specific, uh, specific features of your company. So you need evidence from the organization itself. Um, Rousseau and Barnes stress the importance of um, relying on the expertise of practitioners and they also uh, advocate taking into account the values and perceptions of stakeholders. <coughs> and, and, and these um, uh, three, I will start with the practitioners, then the uh, evidence from the organization, and finally evidence from the stakeholders to, to show uh, what can be improved in our opinion. Practitioners are people like uh, managers, uh, business leaders, consultants, and so on and so forth, who have uh, specific expertise that uh, can be valuable in, in uh, making uh, new decisions. It's really about their expertise. It's, it's not just about any intuition or personal opinion they may have. That's important. And the, the difference between ex, uh, expertise and mere intuition is that this expertise is specialized knowledge. That is the result of um, um, practicing uh, the same thing uh, over and over again in a setting that has been uh, relatively stable, uh, if the, the environment changes constantly, then, then you don't practice the same thing over and over again. And uh, what is needed is, is also that the people who have uh, uh, practiced uh, this uh, received direct and objective feedback. If you can do the same thing over and over again in a stable environment, receiving direct and objective feedback, then you become an expert, and if you're an expert, then maybe it's useful that uh, people turn towards you and ask uh, what you think. And um, Byron and Rousseau discussed several methods that you can use um, uh, in order to try to find out what uh, practitioners um, uh, think. And many of those are uh, highly reliable from a social scientific point of view, but then all of a sudden they talk about walking around and asking. So you just walk around uh, in your company and you, you uh, ask um, uh, people. Maybe I, I should uh, read it around. So the quickest and the easiest way to gather evidence from practitioners is by walking around and asking. Uh, of course, this method is prone to bias. Uh, but sometimes wandering around in an unstructured manner through the workplace and asking people randomly uh, their judgment about an assumed problem or preferred solution is a good way to start. Um, so, so one of the, the problems you immediately encounter is, is uh, things like uh, selection bias. So the question is, why do they advocate walking around and asking? given that they stress the, 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 the importance of the reliability of evidence and given that they know that this um, is not a reliable um, method. Um, 
when characterizing sources of evidence, they, they um, characterize evidence from practitioners um, at the beginning of their book in this way. The first source of evidence is the professional experience and judgment of the people I have um, uh, mentioned. It's not the same as intuition or opinion uh, for the reasons I've uh, specified, and so on and so forth. But given how they treat things like uh, walking around and asking, uh, what they uh, are really defining here is the first source of information in our framework, and in their framework, um, not of evidence. So what we need is a, a more strict account of evidence from practitioners. It is information. All evidence is information. Um, it is obtained from expert practitioners, not just from anybody. That's uh, just uh, staying very close to uh, Byron and Rousseau. Um, it has to be critically appraised. That's not something we add. That's something they stress over and over again in the fourth chapter of their book. Uh, because um, what you ask, you ask um, um, what people think, even uh, though they're experts and you're inquiring about their domain of expertise, you have to uh, pay attention to the, the, the risk that their um, uh, judgment is prone to cognitive biases. And so what you need is to uh, critically appraise what they say or what they write in order to filter out all these cognitive biases, which by itself can be uh, time consuming. So um, these two things are not uh, something new, but uh, what we uh, think should be stressed more in uh, Barnes and Rousseau's book before uh, handing it over to uh, people in the field is to, uh, stressing that the, the, the methods you use to, um, to um, interview uh, practitioners, uh, that these methods uh, should avoid systematic bias. Um, and um, if you do that, you will be very. Uh, you will be much better at challenging conventional wisdom. One of the uh, aims uh, Barnes and Rousseau themselves uh, have, um, because if you just walk around and ask people, who are who will you ask? Well, those people who are in your own organization. Whereas, if you want to have a representative uh, set, well, if you have a representative sample of. Uh, relevant experts. You also um, uh, gain information from people outside your company and that will improve the quality of your evidence and hence the quality of your uh, decision. Um, rather than saying, well, you could walk around and ask people, but be careful doing that, uh, we would say just don't um, uh, think of walking around as a way of collecting evidence. Um, because it's very hard to to uh, to uh, to try to ignore what uh, what you seem to have learned uh, afterwards, and also critically <coughs> appraising information is time consuming. So rather than first gathering information and critically appraising it and then checking whether it's really it should really count as evidence that's that's the way uh, things are uh, presented in the six a step procedure you should first uh, be more um, um, restrictive when it comes to gathering information in order to avoid time consuming unnecessary time consuming critical so at least for uh, the evidence about practitioners, uh, having a more um, strict definition of evidence um, will be beneficial to uh, organizations and managers. And the same holds for evidence from the organization. I will first discuss two side issues um, that will play a role uh, at the end of this, this, this subsection, if you wish. The first side issue is that um, 
the way Weinstein was so talk about evidence from the organization somehow overlaps with how they talk about evidence from uh, stakeholders. So they, they talk about information you um, God, you, 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 um, you find within your organization itself. Then they make a distinction between uh, hard numbers such as uh, cash flow and so on, on the one hand, and then um, soft elements, uh, perceptions of an organization's culture, for example. But this is very similar to what they will later call uh, evidence uh, from uh, stakeholders. And um, by, by uh, using an example they themselves give, uh, I will try to illustrate how intertwined these two things are, and then we'll, I will uh, argue that we should uh, keep uh, evidence from the organization in terms of hard numbers, apart from evidence from stakeholders in terms of uh, more soft elements and uh, subjective feelings. So the example is about a large input they think. Uh, give examples from uh, managerial practice uh, all the time. Uh, one of uh, the examples is about a large insurance company that decides to change from a regional structure, so people selling stuff, uh, be, be, people selling stuff being responsible for a specific region uh, is turned into people selling stuff uh, being uh, 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 specializing in a uh, specific product. So the board of a large insurance company has plans to change its uh, regional structure to a product-based stru uh, structure. And according to the board, that will uh, secure the company's uh, market presence and drive greater customer focus. But the company's sales managers strongly disagree with this change, arguing that ditching the region-based structure will make it harder to build good relationships with customers and will therefore harm customer service. So you have a decision or a decision in the making, internal criticism, and then the question is how can you use evidence to find out whether it's uh, true that turning to a product-based structure will be beneficial or that it will be harmful. So uh, what that company did was analyzing organizational data um, and uh, those data revealed that customer uh, satisfaction was well above industry aver uh, average. That's one thing. Another thing is that um, further data analysis showed a strong negative correlation between, on the one hand, the account manager's monthly travel expenses, these are hard numbers, uh, and on the other hand, uh, customer uh, satisfaction suggesting that sales managers who live close to their customers score higher on customer satisfaction. So the evidence um, um, uh, could be used to argue against this uh, intended uh, reorganization. Um, but the, the point is that um, uh, monthly travel expenses are hard numbers and um, what you need to do to, 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 uh, to gather these, uh, to, to assess these, and so on and so forth, is very different from the uh, challenges that uh, you're facing when trying to assess customer satisfaction. And um, in, um, instead of um, allowing for two very different types of evidence from the organization, um, and then having some, some distinct type of information from stakeholders which completely overlap. So um, uh, when I will talk about stakeholders, this is uh, about customers, uh, about suppliers, about um, employees, and it's about their subjective feelings and perceptions, about soft elements. That's, that's just a copy from what is uh, written here. So, in the interest of conceptual clarity, it's better to take these apart, but not just in the interest of uh, conceptual clarity, uh, but first and foremost, because the challenges you're facing when assessing these types of uh, evidence are different. Second side issue is 
related to the question how easy it is to obtain evidence from your own organization. And strangely enough, Barnes and Rousseau say, uh, on the one hand, that it's easy to obtain, and on the other hand, that it's not easy to obtain. Uh, why is it easy to obtain organizational evidence? Well, because it's easy to obtain organizational data, and therefore it's easy to obtain organizational information, and then, for some reason, they equate organizational information with organizational evidence. So, so they say, well, <coughs> companies continuously produce data, uh, for, uh, often uh, automatically. Uh, by definition, data is meaningless. So th these are just, for instance, lists of numbers. Uh, but well, you know your company, uh, so you can uh, start um, analyzing, uh, organizing, structuring those data until it becomes meaningful. For instance, instead of a list of numbers, it becomes a list of uh, birth dates of employees, and that's something meaningful and something you can use to base uh, decisions on. And then they say, well, in the context of this book, organizational evidence refers to data and the ways it has been transformed to make it more interpretable, but that's just the definition of information. And then they don't add anything about, well, but be careful because X, Y, and Z. So there's a, a very strange step they make, which may uh, lead uh, managers or organizations astray. On the other hand, they say, well, no, it's not easy to obtain organizational evidence because the methods you need to obtain um, this evidence are very similar to the methods you need to, um, to um, uh, obtain scientific evidence. Um, and all the uh, uh, possible methodological problems you may encounter in scientific practice are important here as well. So it's difficult. Um, <coughs> it, scientific research is difficult. Uh, gathering and analyzing organizational evidence is very similar. Hence, uh, it cannot be so easy. So that was the uh, second uh, side issue. So what we would like to propose is a more strict definition of evidence from the organization, restricting it to hard numbers, keeping all the soft elements, uh, or relegating uh, all the soft elements to evidence from stakeholders. And when is this information uh, derived from that about hard numbers evidence? Well, if and only if it was guided by a causal model, I will say uh, a little bit more on, uh, about this, and uh, in such a way that the research design made those data useful to test that causal model. So it's about hard numbers. The causal model is um, a, a term that Rousseau and Barnes use themselves, but they, they use various terms. They, they use the word causal model, but also logic model, also a theory of change. We think that the word causal model is the, the best um, uh, concept because it's about the mechanisms or the causal processes underlying the organizational problem that you're trying to solve and underlying the solution or uh, the, the relation between the solution and the problem uh, that you're trying to implement. Um, on the next slide, I will uh, cite an example from Yahoo, uh, which Barnes and Rousseau uh, use themselves. And then the research design is um, uh, included in this uh, pro uh, proposal because of our uh, logical um, procedural account of ethics. So um, the, the, the role of this causal uh, model they um, illustrate using an example uh, from Yahoo. This is uh, Marissa. Meyer, and in uh, almost 10 years ago, she decided that, and it's funny that we uh, talked about this issue uh, right before the start of my talk, she decided that um, people should no longer work from home. So she sent out a memo saying, from now on, it's no longer um, um, allowed to uh, work from home. 
And the reason is that she thought that uh, this uh, um, uh, has, that the working from home has a negative on, uh, effect on uh, productivity. Why? Well, because she implicitly used uh, some assumptions about causal processing uh, processes playing a role, including um, the assumption that the speed and quality uh, are sacrificed or often sacrificed when we work from home. Now, this was rather uh, a hippo, the highest paid person's <laughs> opinion. Is this a correct opinion? Is this an incorrect opinion? Well, biotechnologists will argue what uh, should be done is you should try to make that causal model explicit and then test it. So uh, you, you, you should find out that, that this is one of the assumptions driving uh, the decision, or better, the intended decision. And then you should try to uh, gather evidence um, about how well do people, when they work from home, how, do, how well do people well, when they don't, is there a difference, is there a relevant difference, and so on and so forth. So that's why this um, uh, causal model is included in, in, so this is not new, this is um, taken from Bagus and so um, But by um, reasoning in terms of such a causal model, you can much better try to challenge, <coughs> challenge uh, the hippos. That's, uh, that's uh, one benefit. It's more efficient because you, um, you um, can better avoid by, by starting from a specific causal model, you can avoid what a balance and so-called uh, fishing expeditions. It, this has nothing to do with uh, Eddington and, and his uh, uh, fishing net. Um, Fishing expeditions is their term for data mining. If you engage in data mining, you run the risk of finding correlations that ha have, have no practical value. Um, for instance, well, so, so the, the, the notion of, of a spurious correlation is useful here. Not the spurious correlations that uh, derive from common cost structures. These are uh, in many cases practically useful, but the, the, the spurious correlations that just result from, from a time series, and, and they give the uh, example, it's one of these classic examples, the divorce rate in Maine during uh, a certain uh, time frame on the one hand, and the uh, per capita um, consumption of margarine, I think also in Maine, um, they, they have both been increasing for some time, and since they were both increasing, there was a positive correlation between the two. But that's a positive correlation that is it's, uh, completely um, useless. And, and it's a correlation you can find if you're just uh, engaged in data mining, but not if you start from a causal model that, 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 um, that keeps you focused on useful knowledge. And again, quality of evidence is, is uh, better secured. Then, uh, evidence from stakeholders. These are all the people that um, affect uh, decisions and or are affected by decisions uh, from the organization. They can be em employees, for example, inside the organization or uh, people living in the neighborhood of a, a a factory, um, customers, uh, suppliers, and so on and so forth. And what you want to know, uh, and, and they, they um, argue for this based on, on um, ethical motivations, the bouncer of say, well, for ethical reasons, you should take their uh, interests, their values, their concerns uh, into account as much as possible. And they um, give a number of examples, and then they conclude, and this is somehow kind of a, a definition, if, if you wish, of what they mean by um, evidence uh, from stakeholders. This concerns subjective feelings and perceptions that cannot be considered as objectifiable facts regarding a uh, problem or a proposed solution, but it is relevant to the decision uh, and it constitutes uh, stakeholder evidence. So it's 
kind of tautological that uh, the evidence from stakeholders constitutes uh, stakeholder evidence, but anyway, that, that's, that's a side issue. Um, so what they want is um, to gather evidence from those stakeholder uh, concerns um, and values, and of course they add in uh, a way that is as valid as, and as reliable as possible, and then they, they, um, they go through all sorts of techniques and, and uh, things you should take into account, including representativeness of the sample. And then they say, well, maybe you could start with a, a focus group of six people. For example, six employees, and you, you ask their opinion. And then, then maybe um, if uh, you don't have six employees, but hundreds, then, then maybe you should add to the results of this uh, focus group also a larger survey. Um, that is, in our uh, opinion, um, potentially misleading because you, you end up with information from this focus group that is not evidence, but it's hard to, to discount it as being uh, uh, non-evidence. And it's also um, uh, inefficient if you, you uh, um, invest in focus groups that will not lead to, um, to evidence. Um, so it's better to have an account of evidence also from stakeholders that stresses the importance of uh, the use of procedures or methods that do not systematically create bias. So to conclude, we, we support the project. Uh, many of the things they write, well, they, they try to write in, in as digestible a way as possible. Uh, it's, it's, a, a, it's a page turner. Um, and, and most of what they write is, is uh, justifiable, but then every now and then they seem to conflate their own definitions of uh, evidence, uh, information and data, and although they want evidence to be reliable, they advocate procedures that uh, clearly um, uh, make you vulnerable to misleading evidence. So, um, You should be careful not to treat information that is not evidence as evidence. Uh, by um, applying this conceptual distinction uh, much more radically. And um, when they advocate exploratory methods, well, it's okay to use exploratory methods, but don't fool yourself and don't um, think you're uh, uh, collecting evidence. And when you do that, and you uh, don't mislead yourself, your company will be more uh, efficient and your decisions will be more efficacious. <laughs> 60 minutes. <laughs> Let us take five minute breaks yeah. for Pierre.
Okay, so let's start. Yeah, tell me when. I'll try to find a sheet of paper. It's just me in the way of the. Yeah, okay, yeah, I think we're, we're good. So, it's on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So now it's part of the comments that for the beginning of the discussion, and it's my pleasure again to, to receive for the first time Pierre-André from the Cher Ouvert, who is uh, Chargé de Recherche at FNRS in another center, the center, uh, the interdisciplinary center of the Cher Ouvert about justice, economy, and social ethics. Social ethics, social ethics yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm very happy to be invited here to comment on this very interesting presentation. And thank you very much, Ben, also for sharing with me uh, your draft paper, which I found super interesting. Um, although I have to apologize, because I am not a philosopher of science. Um, my research area, as it has been said, is more in the political philosophy and ethics field. However, I happen to have a degree in management, a master's degree in management from a previous life. Uh, and therefore, I have a personal interest in the topic. And uh, more precisely, the title of my degree is a, master de is a Master of Science in Management. And I have to say, I have been asking myself for quite a few years uh, how scientific management exactly is. Uh, so, therefore, I'm very happy to learn more, learn more about that today. Uh, so, as I said, I had the chance to read your draft version of the paper, and I found it pretty convincing. Uh, I think it shows quite well that evidence-based management, as theorized by Valens and Rousseau, although it looks like a very sound approach at first sight, uh, very common sense, actually suffers from quite significant shortcomings. Um, I find your main thesis about evidence as a three-place relation very convincing, that it's not only about hypothesis and information, but also about the adequate method to gather unbiased information. Um, and I think this clarification is welcome, um, that it is not only about logic and observation, but also about procedures. Because indeed, it seems to me that managers and management consultants very often do not embarrass themselves with strict met methodological procedures um, when they want to prove a point. Um, actually, it seems to me that they usually try to confirm their hypothesis rather than really try to test, uh, test it. Um, Maybe it has to do with these hippos you mentioned, like trying to confirm the hypothesis that come from the, the top of uh, the, the hierarchy. Um, well, at least that's uh, my very biased experience from what my friends who still work in this field uh, tell me. So that's my equivalent of walking around and asking. <laughs> um, I think a second very valuable clarification that you provide in your paper is that you show that there are different epistemic issues related on the one hand to the hard numbers and on the other hand to the soft elements, uh, as they are called. Um, these soft elements, the, so the perceptions by managers, employees, external stakeholders, uh, you show that they need to be carefully handled and gathered, um, and that random interviews and representative surveys are better than these focus groups that are very commonly used actually in management, in marketing, um, although they obviously are not very reliable as a source of evidence. Um, but you also show that the hard numbers um, may also not be so reliable and then that they may include some bias and what came to, to my mind was actually the, the example of the accounting standards uh, which profoundly influence how the financial statements of a company uh, look like, what, what they look like and what they say. And actually it shows that these hard numbers, they're not pure facts. They carry uh, a lot of interpretation. Um, let's just think about amortization, for, for example, in financial statement. That's pure view of the mind, actually, that the, there's a decrease in the value of uh, 
the capital assets. Um, I also very much liked your comment uh, on big data. I think, well, right now people are very enthusiastic about big data. And it's probably also, I presume, the driver of uh, the enthusiasm for evidence-based management, that you can gather so much data that <coughs> management is going to become very scientific. But you show that there's also a threat in big data because... But this is Baron San Rousseau who, who uh, pointed okay. this uh, threat. So, um, not well, to steal the credit. It's, it's, it's quite interesting that um, to show that there's a threat because without an adequate causation theory, it can lead to putting your trust in spurious correlations like that of the divorce rate and the rate of consumption of margarine uh, in, in Maine. And um, so therefore, um, I found the paper very convincing. And I've asked myself three questions when reading your paper that I would like to share with you. Um, the first is about the reasons for such a lack of method in evidence-based evidence -based management. The second is more generally about the epistemic status of management. And the third one, I apologize a bit out of your scope, but it's about the, I think, very important ethical implications of this type of management. Um, so first, my, my, my biggest question as I read the paper was why? Why does evidence-based management and more generally managers, management consultancies, disregard the importance of these methodological procedures. Actually, I find it quite surprising when you compare to how established these methods are in the natural science, in the social sciences. It's quite surprising that they are the, these um, very well-established methods do not are not translated into this area. and. Indeed, to my knowledge, um, there's no specific methodological training in management consultancies like the, the interns, when they start there, they, they learn by doing and uh, most of them, I assume, do not have training in social science, uh, so they more or less have soft skills but not these methodological skills. And um, so, you also mentioned that convenience sampling uh, is cheap and easy, and I think that's a big reason why uh, the more satisfying methods uh, are not used, because uh, managers and management consultancies want to go fast, want to do things cheap, uh, cheaply, and uh, but to a deeper level, um, one may ask, why would people prefer this quick and dirty approach to a more scientific one if, for example, it may be more efficient and be a better way to, to manage the company. And my, yeah, so, so that's, that's my question. Do you have any clues why uh, these methods are so much disregarded? And my guess is that as long as it works, uh, they do not really care about scientific knowledge, whether it's good or bad science. but. I'd be happy to have your uh, comment on that. My second question... Would you like him to answer first? Or do you want to do the three questions? Um, what do you prefer? Maybe. I'm a bit tired, so uh, <laughs> one by one. Oh, okay. um, so, what are the reasons for this lack of methodological rigor? Uh, I wrote down, and then you, you said two things. In management, on one hand, and in evidence-based management, yeah. on the other hand. So um, maybe it's good to, to, uh, to keep these sub-questions apart. Why is it um, absent in management? Well, you gave some of the reasons yourself, I guess. Uh, it's easier and it's cheaper. Um, and the, the, the evidence-based management initiative, which tries to, to, uh, to uh, to um, raise uh, methodological standards in management is relatively recent. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the second reason. And then you said, as long as it works, the, the cheap and easy methods uh, should be okay. 
question is, how do you know, well, what do you mean by it works? It, it's, one interpretation could be it meets a certain standard we do have, and that's easy to, to, to check. Another interpretation would be it works better than alternative methods. That's a kind of factual criterion. But how can you find out if you don't apply the alternative? So um, maybe um, the, the, the uh, line of reasoning is that it works. Uh, and I side with uh, Rousseau and Barnes that if you would treat it counterfactually and if you would try to, to, to do your best to, to, to uh, test that counterfactual by implementing a more uh, uh, scientific approach as well, then most likely you will find out that um, going scientific, although it's, um, it may take more time, um, may be uh, worth the effort. Um, at the beginning of their, of their book, they um, devote some time to the question whether companies do have time some decisions have to be taken uh, in five minutes and then you don't have time to, um, to, to set up large uh, surveys and, and uh, uh, do a systematic review of the available literature. But I, I think that large companies should uh, be more uh, future looking and, and try to invest in gaining the um, scientifically based knowledge over a larger period of time that uh, could be used and, 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 and uh, implemented um, when five minute decisions have to be made. So that would be uh, what I think is the answer to your question when uh, focusing on management in practice. Then the question is why is um, why can you find problematic advice in a book about evidence-based management that tries to be as, as helpful as possible? I guess one uh, possible explanation could be that they try to make it a page turn. Mm -hmm. um, so although they, they write about, uh, well, it, it's in a sense, uh, maybe I've said this at the beginning of the talk, it reads like a handbook of social uh, scientific methodology, mm -hmm. but also um, uh, <coughs> a book full of anecdotes about uh, Yahoo and uh, the Challenger and, 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 and insurance companies uh, considering to restructure. So they, they, they're trying to do both at the same time. And maybe that could be one reason. Also, the book is written by Barnes and Rousseau plus four other people. Mm -hmm. So sometimes the, when, when we uh, hint at um, the lack of conceptual rigor, and then maybe that's the, the philosopher's uh, um, uh, professional um, uh, misformation, or how should I call it? Um, <laughs> professional disease. <laughs> professional disease, thank you. Um, could also be explained by the fact that, that this is um, collaborative work. Um, so maybe a, a second um, uh, edition of the book could, could be uh, improved in that sense. And then, yeah, um, by applying a more severe or strict definition of evidence, the whole uh, project could be improved. But that's just repeating my, the main point of the, of the talk. So that would be, so, so I would be uh, far less uh, critical of um, evidence-based management as a program than uh, of uh, management in practice, because I, uh, much of that, um, uh, and, and, and in this sense, I just side with uh, Rousseau and Wyatt. Great, thank you. Um, well, my second question is a bit related to that first one, but I try to play the devil's advocate a bit more. Um, I'm wondering about the exact epistemic status of management and whether there can be such a thing as evidence-based management. Um, it's a bit of a naive question, but I was wondering whether we can really call management a science of, or if it's more of an art. Um, 
I find you cite at one point in your paper, you cite Berns and Rousseau, who make uh, an analogy between the good practitioner and uh, a good violin player. And uh, therefore, I, I find that analogy quite telling uh, in the sense that it seems that to them it's about experience in the broader sense and not experimentation, like testing uh, a specific hypothesis. And I was wondering at that point whether we can really say whether um, management statements in management, in management science can really be falsified or not. Um, and can we, for example, say that an, organ an organizational structure A fares better than an organizational structure B in terms of net income or share value, I don't know. Um, do we really have the counterfactuals that you mentioned in your uh, reply? Um, it, in any case, it seems that in the famously studied case studies in management schools, which are really the bread and butter of uh, the teaching of management, we are very, very far from uh, controlled experiments in labs, but we are also very far from uh, surveys in social sciences in terms of methods. Um, and therefore, I was wondering um, whether it can really be uh, that can really be counterfactual. Whether you can really treat it as a, a falsifiable uh, field of knowledge. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Again, I, I see two sub questions. One one is related to the question whether management is a science or an art, and then the other about falsifiability of claims and which methods to use to test claims. Um, there's, I, I would definitely be willing to grant that, that there is a, a, an art-like component to management, just like there is an art-like component to medicine. Um, so, um, I've shown the, 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 the deliberate um, uh, parallels between how Bayern's have also defined evidence-based management and how Sackett et al. Uh, defined evidence-based medicine. Um, Sackett et al. reacted against a state of, of uh, the science of medicine, or no, the practice of medicine where medical doctors just made medical decisions because uh, of the way they had made medical decisions before and just because they were an authority in their field. Um, and, and second of all, uh, claimed that um, scientific evidence should be uh, brought into medical practice in, in a way more systematic uh, way. Um, in medicine, of course, you can have these randomized controlled trials. Um, but um, within the field of evidence-based medicine, even though, well, no, not even though, on the one hand, you have this, this um, uh, strong reliance on uh, scientific evidence and in particular on um, randomized control, the results of randomized controlled trials. Then there is a discussion about what is still the role of uh, the professionals implementing uh, the, the, um, uh, the knowledge. Evidence-based medicine has sometimes been interpreted as trying to get rid of all the um, uh, uh, specific input from the professionals themselves, but then when you read Sackett et al, they, they really uh, uh, tried to, to make uh, clear that um, it's uh, scientific evidence on top of uh, ex uh, practitioners' expertise and not instead of. And the same you see in, in this evidence-based management, the fact that um, evidence from practitioners is uh, one of the four sources of evidence shows how much they um, value the art uh, uh, 
arty side, um, should I phrase it, <laughs> of, of management practice. So, um, summing up, is it a science or an art? I think it's, it's a false dilemma. It's at, at, at least the second, but the, the first can be uh, added, uh, and that's useful as long as it's done properly. And that brings me then to the uh, second sub-question. Um, how can you test claims about management practice, given that randomized control trial, you talked about uh, lab trials, even uh, abstracting away from uh, investigating things in, in labs. Um, there is less room for randomized control trials and, for instance, in uh, experimental psychology. But you could bring in uh, insights from experimental psychology. You could bring in um, um, uh, insights from uh, other social sciences. I've had discussions with Anwerken, so the, the, the students, uh, the student, uh, every time I um, uh, wanted to, to um, make room for at least the, the abstract possibility of conducting uh, randomized controlled experiments uh, with uh, companies, uh, one set of companies doing uh, strategy A, uh, implementing strategy A, second set of companies uh, implementing uh, strategy B. In principle, you could do this whether you will be able to convince companies to, to, um, to engage in what might seem risky uh, alternative strategies, I don't know, and, and she may be right that they're, they, they, uh, most of the time they would be uh, too, too conservative. Um, but randomized control trials is not the only uh, methodology available. So even if you gather purely observational uh, evidence about how companies happen to, to, um, to behave, um, where you did not, as a researcher yourself, um, decide uh, what they had to do, even then you can um, derive um, uh, valuable causal conclusions. It's harder than in, in, uh, when uh, relying on randomized control trials, but it's not impossible. So, can management claims or claims in management science be tested and falsified? I would say yes. Um, much of the social scientific literature is based on non-experimental observational evidence. So. Uh, just use those techniques. And so my third question is a bit out of the, the scope of the presentation, but it's about the ethical implications of such a form of management. Um, the uh, implications? Ethical implications. Ethical, yeah. um, I was wondering um, what what's the effect of evidence-based management on the responsibility of managers? Um, if there is evidence that a course of action or decision A is better than an alternative decision B, um, then are managers liable for every failure to reach their goals because they have disregarded the evidence? Well, one could think there's kind of a slippery slope uh, there and that it could be also a way for these hippos to shift the responsibility down to the middle managers to the lower managers in the company. Well, it, it reminded me uh, a little bit of um, this form of management which, is, uh, which consists in delegating responsibilities by ascribing a goal and then middle managers have uh, total freedom to do whatever they want as long as they reach the goal. And I was wondering whether there's 
some sort of synergy between this uh, authority delegation and responsabilization of uh, middle managers and evidence-based management. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Uh, well, I, I try to see what uh, I know an ethicist. Um, If we if we if we make the parallel again with evidence-based medicine, could we say that well, we are used to consider that um, like uh, a surgeon has quite a big responsibility, uh, whereas manager maybe has a very limited responsibility with what he's doing. Does it mean that with evidence-based management, we are going to? Uh, consider managers to be much more viable because there is evidence. Because if it's an art and there's no evidence and it's not scientific, you can say, okay, it's not their fault, it doesn't work. But if there's evidence, it's quite a different question. I don't know. Well, so, so this is just a gut feeling, but I think that um, you have described the line of reasoning which makes the managers more uh, liable. And you've also described a line of reasoning making them less uh, liable by shifting responsibilities, delegating responsibilities. And I think that you can, in principle, go either way with evidence-based management and you can go either way without evidence-based management. So, um, A medical doctor applying um, outdated um, uh, procedures or, or uh, therapies could, I guess, in some sense be held uh, responsible for uh, unfortunate outcomes. Um, so, in a sense, well, uh, by reasoning in a, in a parallel fashion, you could say that um, if there exists evidence saying that strategy A is better than strategy B, in what, whatever sense of better, because uh, the word better can cover um, uh, expected uh, um, uh, extra sales or, or um, lesser um, uh, pollution or whatever um, but if it exists then then uh, at least in large companies in big companies uh, which could have resources for um, uh, for um, uh, retrieving uh, evidence assessing evidence of, well, following the six a step procedure so if you um, did not uh, do a good effort to find the, the, the right uh, available evidence, then in some sense you could be held responsible. Um, on the other hand, um, you may be right that, that um, uh, managers could have a... Well, now maybe I'm now too, um, too cynical, so you got this. Um, <laughs> uh, some managers do have a tendency to, to uh, escape uh, uh, liabilities. Um, and, and one uh, way to do that could be by, by uh, uh, blaming the middle managers who were in charge of, of fight. So I think that uh, all the existing problems can uh, be reinforced or can be, um, can be um, attenuated. It, it, but you can go either way. But that's that's just now uh, improvising. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, now we open the floor to any question, even online. I have many. But. I have many. <laughs> so for disclaimer, I'm a philosopher of medicine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, because so. I was not familiar with uh, this movement, even though I have also a small degree in business, but I've never heard of it. In any case, when I am presented with what they call evidence-based management, 
as a person that is familiar with evidence-based medicine, it's very weird. Uh, I feel like you made a good job at, at being charitable. Um, charitable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, because it's very strange, like the, the way they are de defining evidence, it's very strange. Because I was, I was expecting the approach being about scientific research and management. And in the end, what you presented is like, no, it's not, it's too complicated. So we don't care about the scientific research. No, not really. no. Um, um, one of the uh, sources of evidence is Science. scientific research findings. And we just happen not to talk about that fourth component okay. in our paper. But they do talk about it. They do talk about it. And they, they mostly focus on, on the, well, what they talk about is uh, how systematic reviews should be done. So in, in that sense, it's, it's very similar to, um, to Cochrane collaboration style okay. uh, reasoning. The point is, um, well, at least that's, that's an analogy that I find um, uh, illuminating. In evidence-based, well, in medicine, you can try to find as many uh, research papers as possible. You still need to translate all those, all that knowledge to the concrete patient in front of you. So even in medicine, you need more information, more evidence than the purely uh, uh, scientific evidence. If you define uh, scientific evidence in terms of outcomes of randomized controlled trials and so forth. So. Yeah, but, but uh, they wouldn't call it evidence. Uh, it's okay. information about the patient, it's not evidence. Because evidence is just like uh, specific procedures to have medical knowledge. Uh, I mean, some lower level in the hierarchy can be just anecdotal knowledge or professional experience, but they are very much you know, on the lower end of the hierarchy. And for instance, uh, stakeholder values in concerns, I mean, for example, in the case of medicine, that would be the values of the patients, they are not evidence. Like, it's not, they are not in the, they just are not medical knowledge. They are values that you have to take into account in taking a decision. And that's where the, where medicine meets ethics. So it's weird because then it's, uh, it, um, I feel like they have really, like you actually, exactly like you said, the concept of evidence is very really fluid, like very strange. Um, and maybe because they don't want to go full on, we want a lot more science because it's too expensive. I don't know. Well, I will try again to defend them. Um, <laughs> What you need in a, when you want to apply scientific medical knowledge is a reliable diagnosis of the characteristic of the, of the patient. And here you need a reliable diagnosis of the characteristics of the company and its social environment. And you can acquire information about the, inform uh, the organization and its environment in a good way or in a bad way, just like you can um, uh, run uh, reliable tests on a patient and or unreliable tests. So I see more parallels, um, perhaps, than, than, than you do. Um, I, mean, I guess I feel like it's a good catchphrase, ca ca catchphrase to say evidence-based management, but I feel like it's, it's broader than Okay, well, I'll um, think about the possible disanalogies more yeah, uh, like than, than, than we have done so far. We have taken the analogies for granted and then ignored the parallels with evidence-based medicine. Okay. And, and as a result, I, I did not systematically think about <coughs> the disanalogies uh, yet. Okay, well. Good. Mm -hmm. Now? Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so yeah, I want to raise my question because it's also connected to this, these analogies, although I don't know much about uh, philosophy of medicine or, 
for the talk, but I was thinking um, in the case of medicine, the goal is clear, and we know that what, what we want is that the patient is alive, has a good life, etc. However, in companies, uh, so the question is, is it possible that we have uh, same data, same observations, same evidence in two different companies but the management is completely is completely different because the goals are different. I mean, one case something more like equality, etc., and the other is making as much as much money as possible. And then it's a margin. And then I don't know. I wanted to push this, this analogy in the case of medicine and in the case of management. And whether you you would agree that it's possible to have exactly the same evidence but two different correct uh, management strategies. Um, I think it's definitely possible to have the very same data and evidence and two different managerial strategies, whether you could both call them correct. Um, well, what I have in mind is if you have uh, clear evidence that um, production method A is both um, uh, more environment friendly and more expensive and the other one is more polluting and cheaper then you can easily see two different managerial strategies emerging whether both can be called correct that then um, that depends on on your uh, ethical framework um, from uh, uh, a profit maximizing maximizing a perspective the one will be the better and the other one will be uh, wrong from an environmentalist perspective, uh, vice versa, um, but that, um, and now I am um, uh, zooming out a little bit from, from the specific question, that other things, other determinants do play a role in management decisions other than uh, the available evidence, that, that's for certain. Whether that's a big or a, a, a medium-sized disanalogy with um, evidence-based medicine or with medicine, um, you seem to go in the direction of it being a, a big disanalogy. But even in medicine, you can um, <coughs> either go for uh, maximizing life expectancy or maximizing uh, quality adjusted life years and, and so on and so forth or for minimizing uh, costs for society but you, there as well you can go in different directions starting from the same evidence because values and goals do play a role yeah this was this was really cool thanks um, I, I also have an analogies question but in a different direction so um, because one thing that I thought was neat about this was, you know, it struck me that your argument in the center surrounding moving from the two-place evidence relation to a three-place evidence relation, I mean, that's just old-fashioned, cool, bread-and-butter philosophy of science, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, that's going to, I mean, you, you, know, you, have the, you have the Eddington example there, right? That's going to apply to, it seems to me, you know, anybody who cares about taking empirical data and acting on it, right? And so what interests me here is, so I, I, I wonder then what you think, I'm trying to put this in a way that doesn't make it sound like way too broad and vague, but let me just make it broad and vague and hopefully you'll understand what I mean anyway. Um, does this just sort of mean that, the, in that sense, does that just make evidence-based management another kind of candidate science? And therefore, it being, being confronted with a general argument about the role of evidence in philosophy of science. And so we just kind of have a, you know, we have an argument here that applies pretty broadly across philosophy of science. You're specializing it for the case of what sort of starts to feel like one particular kind of empirical science. So do you, do you want to take really seriously this idea, the, the apparent analogy that comes out of the way that you analyze what they're doing, that this is just a proposal to turn management into a social science. So if they're going to do that, they better do it well. 
Um, I mean, are you are you are you happy to are you happy to kind of to kind of bite down on that inference to like let to follow them in that direction, or do you want to be a little more careful? This because this relates to your to the you know to Pierre Andre's second question about this kind of art science balance because I think that's that's really interesting, and I'm not. Yeah, I wasn't one hundred percent clear on how how you were seeing that relationship, sort of applying this general this general philosophy of science argument might make you think that. We really have a pure science kind of way of thinking about what evidence-based management people are doing, but also there's this kind of art side. So yeah, how how are you seeing that kind of broader positioning? I hope that was that was sufficiently clear for you to be able to answer it. Um, okay. Um, so I think that management studies should be as scientific as possible. And as a matter of fact, I would say that management studies is just a kind of social science with input from uh, psychology and maybe from other disciplines, but broadly speaking, it's a sub-discipline within social sciences and it should be as methodologically sound as possible. Um, And um, so that's one thing. Then the question is, should management itself be scientific? That, that's a, a bit a, a strange question. Uh, management itself is a practice which has art-like um, uh, uh, features, which involves uh, values and goals that themselves are not scientifically grounded. But the... the to go from a, a present a situation to uh, uh, a set goal uh, uh, many times or many ways and it's best to use the best way uh, and therefore um, scientific evidence and other um, uh, reliable uh, information and, and, and uh, information gathered in the right way can be helpful. Um, Yeah, but no. no, I think I think already actually. Is, yeah, I, let me let me let me jump back in because I think I think already the, the management management studies distinction is super helpful for me. That that already clarifies a lot. I think the kind of the question that I had about about sort of which part is the kind of analogized bit to a social science and which part has the sort of techne aspect, you know, yeah. the, and I think that already, yeah, that already helps. So in that sense saying, sure, yeah, this is, you know, this is a, 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 a supposed methodology to render management studies a kind of fully empirical, at least potentially, um, approach, but that, it's that, it's that management studies management relationship that's going to be kind of tense and interesting and weird. That's a, that's a, I hadn't, I hadn't thought of it in those terms before, but that's a cool, that's a cool thing to point out. But, but they also advocate, and I think they're right, to, to have better methods employed by companies, organizations themselves. So I made a distinction between management and management studies, but I'm not trying to blur it again. Yeah, but be, yeah. Because the, the whole point of their project is that maybe in one way, management should pay more attention to management studies. Sure. Um, sure. And then, then the question is, uh, as you said, well, uh, the, our basic point is not new at all. And then the question is, how relevant is this paper? It, it's not relevant for philosophers of science. We will not send it to a philosophy of science journal. Um, is it relevant for management studies? Well, you would hope it is not. <laughs> <laughs> if it is, <laughs> that's <laughs> problematic. So, so I think that if you would uh, talk about this with Denise Rousseau, for example, she would say, yeah, we all know that. Then the question is why the book itself is some, sometimes misleading. So I do think it's still uh, relevant in that sense. Um, and it is relevant for managers and uh, the organizations uh, which they lead. Because um, 
for the very, very same reasons that uh, evidence-based management as a research program itself is relatively new, relatively innovative, and useful, or, or, uh, I think, uh, relevant for the field. Okay, cool. That's helpful. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, can we go back to the slide where the full type of evidence? The the four type of evidence, four types of evidence. Thank you. Alexa. Is this yeah, big yeah, enough? So, because I was wondering, like, if we remove the scientific part and uh, maybe the stakeholder values, uh, is there any manager who would argue I took my decision without based on any facts <laughs> and on any experience? I feel like it's like nobody would argue against that. Uh, well, it depends what you mean by facts and by experience. So, one, so um, no, no manager would say I take decisions regardless of facts and regardless of experience. But the question is, how do you gather the facts and the experience? Do you walk around, uh, just meet with the, the three colleagues that you know best? and follow their uh, opinion you know already? Or do you more systematically uh, try to investigate what people on the work floor are thinking? These are two different ways to do the same, namely basing decisions on facts and experience. And walking around is cheaper and easier and quicker, but less reliable. So there would be people arguing that it's good to walk around and ask. Well, the, the, now I go back to the very first slide. It's the cheapest. <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe they don't have it, they're just like, yeah. So, the, the how, roughly half of management decisions fail because uh, most of the time it, it's. Um, this failure, now I'm quoting Byron and Rousseau again, is tied to managers who rush to judgment, impose their preferred solutions, fail to confront the politics behind decisions, ignore uncertainty, downplay risks, and discourage search for alternatives. So that happens all the time, even by people who think they... Where does this 50% evidence come from? The best available management research suggests that around the half. <laughs> <Suggests that. laughs> okay. yeah. Trust that. Trust that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so unless you, you can prove that this is not true, no, but this is is um, what um, the best available management research um, suggests. Yeah. Okay. But then I feel like they, uh, I guess they don't want to make enemies because the way they present stuff is a little bit like. Especially the part on expertise. Like it's very strange to tell to someone you have a real expertise that you you learn stuff by repeating decision and basically by confirmation bias, but also no, you should also follow some more rigorous methods. So it's very strange. Because if you in, but in that no, no, think about engineering. They do exactly the same. It's not, it's not pure scientific. Yeah, but for instance, in medicine, if you take this description of expertise, you don't have medicine. You have the history of medicine when okay. we have no drugs okay. that worked. Basically, just confirmation bias. Okay. And so it's a little bit weird not to be a little, like, I feel like it, they, to make their claims stronger, they should be a little bit more confrontational about that part. Mm. So the advice is to make use of ex expertise from practitioners. And that itself comes with two risks. First risk is that you do not um, have a re representative sample of the practitioners. <coughs> That's why they... Um, stress um, uh, methods like uh, surveys and so on, and why we uh, stress that the fact that this has to be stressed, has to be stressed much more. Maybe I can reformulate, but if 50% of 
this expert decision fail, maybe you know, if we shouldn't consider their expertise as reliable evidence. Why is it in the fall? Like, well, maybe the O in HIPPO is relevant here. The, the O stands for opinion. So many of these decisions, if what I've just quoted is, uh, is correct, many of these decisions in the end are based on opinions. The but CEO you, are not the experts. Yeah. Yeah, but the decisions, you said they were management decisions. Yeah. So they so fail. CEO decisions. So why is it good expertise? Like, what do they have the expertise? No, no, no. no, 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 no then, if, then, then. if you have a baker that keeps making bad bread, you wouldn't say they have a very good expertise at making so bread. Like, I don't know. So you have to identify the good bakers? Yeah. Uh, they, I think they, they seems use the example of a, of a baker themselves. So, <laughs> <laughs> um, no. The decisions, I think, they're referring to here, half of which fail, are uh, decisions that are not based on expertise itself. So they're from the hippo. Well, the hippo is an opinion, that, so they're from, made by the highest paid person, or a, a select group of highly paid people. But that's where well, I can disagree. Like, if the field as it's, is like very unscientific, and rely only on subjective expertise. Like it's like medicine in the 19th century. Like I don't see the difference. Yeah, but, but the advice is have a look in your organization and outside uh, and see what the judgment, not just the opinion, the judgment is of experts, where expertise is they, they use the example of a baker. A baker is an expert because a baker can bake loaves of bread uh, ev uh, uh, almost every day of a year, years uh, after, uh, after years, in a relatively stable uh, environment. And he or she gets direct feedback if uh, yeah, the but produce I think is that bad. That argument is good, like, because but if you try to make the same argument with doctors, it's a very, very bad argument. Yeah, but I think I, I have a better analogy, is that, because I'm teaching this, <laughs> when engineers do risk assessment, so it cannot be completely scientific, scientific because there's a normative aspect mm -hmm. that is based on experience and judgment, and some kind of difficult way to modelize the way they see what society is ready to accept in a certain circumstance. But of course, if they go against scientific data, it's bad. So they have to take into account the best scientific data, but it, but it cannot be reduced. So my impression is that what they would, what you were saying is that if they take into account the, the experience of expert, they have to do something similar to, to find, to identify among the experts or by a sampling, or by another reliable method, which one have the better success for this specific task? That cannot be just scientific. What I was surprised is that it seems that they have a lot of, and maybe your team too, confidence in random sampling. For engineering expert, we would say random sampling is Depends on the population of engineers, expert that you want to sample. Maybe it's not the best way to get the best represent the best. Random sampling group. is not the only. Yeah, uh, it's not the only. The, but the idea is to identify these individuals because it's not strictly scientific. It's part of this know-how. Mm -hmm. yeah, but you also said that the whole point of this method is going against the authority and the, oh, I just learned that at school. Yeah, so but in engineering firm, they have the EPO system too. <laughs> so in engineering firm, if you look at decision, many are very bad because they are made by the guy that is paid the highest. The goal, therefore, is to find the good experts. No, I'm just skeptical about who is a good expert when there is no scientific evidence? Well, but can the I... Doctor, uh, not be an expert if he, if he just relies on his subjective experience. Yeah. Just can I add something? 
Uh, so first of all, these uh, practitioners, these experts, should not be equated with the highest paid persons. That's one thing. And second, um, what you say about evidence-based medicine, well, about medicine, is that if medicine would have sticked solely to this kind of, of evidence, then there would have been a problem. Or, to, to rephrase it, the, no. the major advances in medicine happened because we only after um, looking more broadly than just what, what experts thought. And even a little bit like removing, because a lot of, well, this is an argument made, made by Alexander uh, Berg in a paper, but it's very interesting. The idea that this part is where, the, where you find the most bias in uh, the history of medicine, specifically just a history of that, like professional experience and judgment and confirmation bias, yeah. all that bias, so yeah. many types, and then placebo effect, and then... Yeah. Well, I want to add one more thing, and now I'll, yes. I will add two things. First of all, <laughs> they do not say, Lucian Barnes, that we oh, that, that uh, managers should only use this evidence. This is only one of the four sources. Just like in medicine, we also uh, use the results of randomized controls, uh, trials, and so on and so forth. And you're right that. Uh, judgments even of experts can be prone to ki uh, all kinds of bias, but that's what bias and also are aware of, and uh, what uh, and that's why they um, say uh, explicitly that you need to critically appraise these judgments. I don't know if you can. I think it's, just, it's very similar to confusing medical evidence and just. Uh, uh, professional consensus, they can be very different. Yeah. They can, the first one can contradict the second, and then... That's true, but here as well. We, well, so if you do not cut out the other sources of evidence, in particular the scientific research findings, then you have tools to, to find uh, discrepancies. It's, it's just the way that it's presented, it's very... Uh, it's very different than it, the way it is presented in medicine, I guess. Probably it looks cleaner in medicine, but there's probably the same problems. Yeah, the problems are different, and like you said, it's very new. So also maybe that's why they make a strategy, so. like a country strategy, not to go full on. But thinking about these analogies with evidence-based medicine is definitely useful for us. And also the bread analogy. I'm not convinced because <laughs> take care we have bread. Well, in France we have good bread, elsewhere I'm not sure. <laughs> but we don't know if the bread is good in management. Like maybe it's terrible and we're like in you know we're like nowadays maybe management is like bloodletting in the nineteenth century. Yeah, but management no studies, that, that's the that's goal like of management studies. But maybe it's true. No? I, I, don't, I don't want to push it, but because it's capitalist, I think it's the non-starter for you. What? Not at all? Okay. It's just... Uh, it's the, the value is implied, maybe. Not maybe at all. I'm just very confused about what... So, since we passed the time, yes, fortunately, yeah, yeah. like I, I, I had a, a business. Uh, yeah, I had. Uh, sorry, I had five questions, but I and you had more, sorry. and we should continue that in front of a beer yeah. mm -hmm. and to leave the people at home <laughs> to take their own refreshments. Thank you again, our speaker. And our <laughs>